Hey, what is going on, Real Life Family? My name is Angela, and I am so excited because we have a great service ahead of us. We know that God wants to meet you wherever you're watching us from. So let's get started with worship. was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore and worthy is your name Your glory fills this place You alone 
This next part of our service is very special. It's something that not every church does, but we do like to take the opportunity to take communion together at our services in person or online. So we invite you to step into that place of gratefulness with us as we remember the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for us. You know, we were not worthy of the sacrifice. He was worthy. Yeah, he chose to lay down his life for us because he loved us so. We were full of sin, and yet he who knew no sin decided to give it all on the cross. So as we take this bread, which represents his body, which was broken for us, let's thank him. Now, as we take the juice, which represents the blood of Jesus, which was shed on the cross for our sins, let's think of the power that it held. Let's think of everything that it's done to redeem us, all of mankind so that we can be free, so that we can have hope, and that we can live in joy. Let's drink it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on that cross for us. We thank you because it is through that sacrifice that we're able to live in freedom, that we're able to live in joy, that we're able to be called your sons and your daughters. We thank you for the hope that you bring us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. What is going on, Real Life family? Welcome, welcome, welcome. A very special welcome to all of you who are new here. And what you should know if you're new here is that we would love to connect with you. And so connecting with us is just as simple as clicking on that QR code that's going to appear. And alternatively, you can always go to real.life slash connect. Also, you should know we would love nothing more than to pray with you and for you for your breakthrough. So if you're watching this today and you have a prayer request, please, please, please do not leave this broadcast without giving us the opportunity to pray with you. If you're watching this on a platform that has a chat, you can feel free to enter your prayer request in the chat. Alternatively, you can always reach us 24-7, 365 days a year at prayer at real.life. Okay, so I wanna let you guys know something. If you are watching online and you call Real Life your home, then I want to invite you to join our Facebook group, Real Life Online. It is a place where we have community and where we grow together. It's a great place. It goes down in our Facebook group. Let me let you know. It is an amazing group to be a part of and I want to invite you. So all I have to do is go on to Facebook, search Real Life Online and join our group because that's where the community and the conversation continues. It is so much fun. And we have a brand new Facebook group manager. Her name is Sydney. She she is incredible and so myself and her we kind of curate the group and so we would love to see you in our group we're about to step into a moment of generosity and before we do i just want to simply say thank you thank you thank you so much for your generosity it's because of your giving that funds the mission of god that helps us to see changed lives by helping real people find real faith online and as we think about generosity, one of the scriptures that comes to my mind is Matthew 6, 24. And these are the words of Jesus. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think about this a lot in terms of generosity, because one of the things that we treasure, we can agree that we treasure, are our finances. We put a lot of great, we put a great deal of thought and intentionality into our finances. We get upset when we lose money. We're excited when we get money. There's a lot of treasuring that we do towards our finances. And God knows this. And so God is asking us, in every moment, would you trust me with your finances? Because he knows that if we can trust him with our finances, we're trusting him with something that's close to our heart. And so in this moment, as we give, generosity is so awesome because generosity represents the opportunity and the invitation from God to trust him with our finances. Trust him with something that we care so deeply about. If we trust him with this, then there's all kinds of other things that we can trust him with. And so I believe that generosity is an invitation from God to trust him with something that we hold close and we hold dear. Once we do trust him with the things that we hold dear, we get to experience the blessing of God in our lives that only comes from trusting God with the things that we hold dear. And so today, if you've come prepared to give, there are two ways to do that. Number one, you can go to real.life slash give. And number two, you can visit the giving tab on our connect page, which is found at real.life slash connect. So thank you so much for your generosity because your giving really is changing lives. Now, we are about to jump into the message. We are rounding out this Chasing God series. We have Pastor Justin with us today talking about David and Nathan, how to bounce back after failure. It is going to be great. I wanna encourage you to prepare your heart to receive what God has for you today as we jump into the message.
Hey, thank you for connecting today, whether you're online or in person at a campus. You're part of our family, and I'm really thankful for you. Today is super special because we're actually merging two of our campuses to become one great outpost for the gospel. Real Life East and Real Life Soto are now Real Life Orlando. And so the reason this message is recorded is because I'm preaching live from the Orlando campus to help celebrate what God's doing there. So I'd love to kick off this message with a special prayer for that campus. Let's pray together. God, thank you for what you're doing. Today, specifically, we thank you for what you're doing in Orlando and through our church. I wanna pray for Pastor Matt Sanders and uh, Pastor Andy Funes as they bring their congregations together. Lord, we pray that there would be unity, synergy, and power, and that their, their efforts to share the gospel would be blessed by you and many lives would be changed. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, hey, this Chasing God series is very special to me. It's personal, okay, because for so many reasons, I feel like I am David. I look at his life and I see the humble beginnings, I see the constant challenges, the opposition from the inside, I see the personal failures and I can relate to all of it, maybe you can too. David is a man after God's own heart, that's what God says, but his struggle is really our struggle. And especially what we're talking about today, because as we learned last weekend, David fails epically. We know all God's heroes are flawed. God always chooses sinners, really, because he has no other choice. We are all he has to work with. But David sins epically with Bathsheba, and he even kills her husband to cover his tracks. Well, now, guess what? The rent is due. It's time to face the music, and God sends Nathan the prophet to confront David with his sin. And so we're in 2 Samuel, starting with verse 1 of chapter 12. 2 Samuel 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come. David burned with anger against that man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then David said to Nathan, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who, to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. That is a lot and it's so powerful, but a couple things really jump out at me from this passage. First of all, I want us to see sin always costs. Uh, And the reason I want us to see that is because I think the lie from the enemy really from the very first time we're introduced to him in the Bible, the lie is that sin won't cost. Adam and Eve know. Eve says, well, God said if we touch that fruit, we will surely die. The serpent says, you will not surely die. That's the serpent in the garden. You remember, right? Satan lowers the price. And what he does is he raises the payoff. He's a good salesman. You will not die. But in fact, for a limited time, if you act now, you will be like God. See, he elevates the payoff. It's gonna be so good. And then he eliminates the price. Nobody will know it won't hurt anybody. 
This is what he does with us all the time. Makes it seem like sin is gonna have this high payoff with no price tag. So he exaggerates the payoff. He eliminates the price. The problem is it's not true. The truth is that sin always costs. There are always consequences. Even when you can't see them, even when you can't anticipate what they may be, sin is a disturbance in the force, all right, for my Star Wars people. Sin opens the portal to the upside down for my Stranger Things folks. Sin opens Pandora's box for my Greek mythology people, I guess. Anyway, but here's the problem. David bought the lie. He bought the lie that somehow the wives he had, which he had many, by the way, whole other sermon, but all these wives, that somehow Uriah's wife was gonna be better than his own, than what he already had. The pleasure was just gonna be so worth it, right? He exaggerates the payoff, and nobody's ever gonna have to know. There's gonna be this huge payoff, but there's gonna be no price. That's the lie. The truth is sin always has a consequence. God actually tells us that the wages of sin is death. Something dies when we sin, and particularly sexual sin. Uh, Paul teaches in Corinthians that sexual sin is a special kind of sin in which we sin against our own body. And so sin costs. It hurts people. It cuts us off from God. It brings guilt and shame and fear and insecurity and anxiety and doubt and depression. David's sin here had a massive price tag. And listen, whatever the payoff of that first night with Bathsheba was, I promise you, it wasn't worth the price. That's the truth about sin. The payoff is never worth the price. And so David blows it big time. Now the rent is due because sin always costs. All right, that's the first thing I want us to see. But the second thing I wanna make sure we see here is that God forgives sin. Verse 13, uh, Nathan actually says it. David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. See, this is another truth that the enemy doesn't want us to believe. He wants to shame us, alienate us, condemn us, kill us, destroy us. God wants to save us. He's a redeemer. He's our creator. He's our father. He's the lover of our souls. And he's done everything to make forgiveness available to each one of us. So listen, whatever you've done, however badly you've blown it, God's crazy about you. And and here's what I want you to understand. You are not defined by what you've done. You've done things, I've done things. We all have a past, we all are guilty, we all have a record. You are not defined by what you've done, but by what Jesus did for you on the cross. All right, so just last week, talking to a friend, the craziest story. He tells me a story. I I really don't believe it until I confirm it with his wife. So his wife sits down while he tells me the story. And here's, here's what's happening. My friend Chris is golfing with his son, all right? Grown adult son. And I guess as his son is driving the golf cart to go to his ball, he's looking in the wrong direction. He's not paying attention. He runs over his dad with the golf cart, runs him all the way over, boom, boom, right? Keeps going. As he realizes what he's done, he's like, what is that? He looks, uh, he realizes he's run over his dad. So he jumps out of the cart, but he forgets to lock the brake. The cart actually comes down the hill, rolls back over his dad. And so as it goes over, he's like, oh no, he jumps back in and reverses it the other way, forgets the brake again. The cart rolls back over his dad a third time. So I can't believe the story. And his wife's like, no, this is what happened. So the result of all this is that my friend Chris has multiple broken bones in his foot. He has a torn rotator cuff in his shoulder. He's had to have back surgery. He had to have knee replacement surgery, and he, he's had to have bone spur removal from all the broken foot bone shrapnel. And so he's telling me this story, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, this is insane. My question to Chris after I hear the story, I'm, I don't even know why I asked it, maybe to lighten the mood, but I said, okay, Let me get this straight. Your son ran you over three times. He's like, yeah. I said, so you've had surgeries and procedures. You will live with pain and limitation the rest of your life. He said, yes. I said, do you still love him? (laughs) I mean, I figured I knew the answer, but I had to ask. And he said, well, of course I love him. He's my son. I'll always love him. I asked him a second question. Is he still in the will? 
He said, absolutely. I said, here's the thing, that's the Father, right? This is probably the best picture I've had of God in a long time. When you think about our Father in heaven, He loves us. He pays for our golf and we run Him over, but He still loves us, still forgives us, cleanses us of all our sins, clears our record. He's still continuing to work to give us eternal life through His Son, Jesus. Because with the Father, we're not defined by what we've done. We end up, we're defined by what He's done for us because He loves us. And, and so understand today, yes, sin has consequences. That's why God doesn't want it for our life, but God forgives sin. First John chapter one, it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want you to understand it's not if we sin, it's when. It's not a question of uh, will I fail, it's what will I do when I fail. It's really about our response. And, and what God tells us is our response is confess and repent. Get it out, ask for grace. You know, with God, here's the thing, forgiveness is a foregone conclusion. It doesn't matter how bad, how much, how far, how often. David's sin is next level. But Nathan says, the Lord forgives you. Why? Because David confessed his sin before God. Uh, Second Samuel, we, I just read it in verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. Just like that, just like it says in 1 John that if we confess, he's faithful to forgive. Our problem is when we sin, and we all do way more often than we want to raise our hand in church and brag about, but when we sin, where David owns it, admits it, comes clean, comes forward, I've sinned, what most of us do most of the time, we deny. It wasn't me, we deflect wasn't my fault, wasn't my intention, wasn't what I meant. Where David declares his sin, most of us deny our sin. Where David confesses his sin, most of us cover up our sin. We deny, deflect, we blame, we pass the buck, we justify, we make excuses. Think about the first man that God created. Adam sinned, and what did he do? He covered up. They both did. And when God confronted Adam, what did he say? He said, well, it was the woman's fault. She gave me the fruit. In fact, he doesn't just blame Eve. He says, the woman you gave me. God, it's kind of your fault for making Eve in the first place. See, we rarely repent. We rarely confess. We, we don't want to take responsibility. We don't want to ask God for forgiveness. What we try to do is we try to get God to see it from our side. Well, she did this, and he said that, and they're the ones who this, and they started it, and listen, God sees all that. He knows all that. Hebrews tells us that all things are laid bare and uncovered before God. There's nothing he's missing here. He just wants to know, do you see what you did? Do you see where you missed the mark? Do you see what you can do better? If so, confess that. Repent of that. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where I would say the other person is 90% wrong. What God's usually not interested in is me talking about that 90% with him. He's trying to help me through the Holy Spirit see my 10%. See, God can't forgive what you didn't do. God can't forgive what you don't see and what you're not willing to admit because you don't really confess. David says, I've sinned against the Lord. I'm guilty. I own it. And God says, okay, done. There's still consequences to face because sin always has a cost, but you're forgiven. And that's huge. That's huge. That grace. As a dad, I can tell you this, all right, four kids, all different. And uh, over the years when our kids would get in trouble, and they would, even though they're pastor's kids, they still get in trouble, okay? God did not bless us with perfect kids. Probably not you either. Um, that reminds me, by the way, parenting conference at the end of the month. Rob and I are speaking. We are so excited that our church is doing this because it's really important. want to see you guys there if you have kids. But what maybe you've experienced this if you have multiples. Each one of our kids would respond to punishment differently. But the kids who owned it, 
Um, and one of the things we did over the years, a lot of times we'd ask them, what do you think your punishment should be? We both agree on what happened. Um, Elijah, it was funny, he would throw himself in jail. He'd go Old Testament on himself. He'd be like, I just feel like you need to stone me to death in front of the whole church, just like it says in the Bible. I'm like, whoa, 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 that's Old Testament, chill, buddy. He would throw the book at himself, but then you'd have another kid wanting to argue with you about, well, I don't even think what I did was wrong. I think you're being unfair. Let me ask you this. Which one do you think got more grace? You already know. The, the self-own gets grace every time. And, and let me give you another scenario. You get pulled over by a police officer. Uh, you know that feeling and the lights. And so you pull over. Now, listen, you know you were speeding because you're usually speeding. It's really about how fast were you going when they caught you? That's the thing you don't know. So when the officer asks you, do you know why I pulled you over? When you say, no, sir, I have no idea. I've never broken a law in my life and I always give money to the police athletic league and I love cats and listen, you're getting a ticket. They already know, I can tell you, you're going down. But when you say, I, listen, I'm sorry, I, was, I think I was going about 10 over, I wasn't paying attention, my bad, I own it. Can I just tell you, okay, that has worked for me for like 30 years of driving. I've had one ticket in my adult life. I've been pulled over more than that, we'll say, all right? Here's what I'm telling you. Pushback increases punishment. Confession allows correction, and it's an invitation for grace, for God, okay? All he wants to see is, do you see it? Do you get it? If I'm about to pay for your meal, I just wanna know, do you know how much this costs? I'll pay, I just, like, dude, who got the lobster thermidor? I'm paying, I just want you to know what it's costing me. And, and so here's what I'm saying, like God's grace is free, yes, but it's not cheap. It costs Jesus everything to cover our sins on the cross. And so don't take that for granted. Don't cheapen it by acting like you don't need it by acting like it doesn't apply, but confess your sin, repent, admit it, own it. God wants to restore you. He's looking for repentance. Repentance is the, the starting line for restoration and revival. And it's an interesting word because it's like a Bible word. It's a churchy word, but repentance, the Greek word is metanoia. It means to change your knowledge or change your mind. Essentially what you're doing when you repent is you're changing the way you see things. You're changing your mind, you're agreeing with God. What repentance uh, biblically is, it's looking from the perspective of God, seeing what he sees and agreeing with him that he's right. I mean, instead of trying to get God to hear my side, well, they this and I this and it's not fair. God, hold on, I see what you see. I see this the way you see it and I'm wrong. I wanted to see it like I was a victim. They were to blame, it's not my fault, but in my heart, I see I was wrong, I see what I did, I see my sin, I'm responsible, I'm sorry. All God needs to forgive you is repentance. I'll say it this way, God has one weakness, in my opinion, okay? The almighty, all-powerful, all-perfect God has a weakness, and it's, it's this, he has a soft spot for self-aware sinners. I've seen it so many times and in my own life, but when we come to the place where we metanoia, right? We change our mind, we agree with God, we confess our sin, what happens is he is gracious and forgives our sin. Now he really shouldn't, uh, we wouldn't, right? But he does every time, no matter how many times we run him over with the golf cart, he loves us and, and he forgives us and his grace is available to us. See, David, listen, David isn't a Bible hero because he didn't fail. He, he's a man after God's own heart because of what he did when he failed. He ran back to the Father. He confessed his sin because he was chasing God. That's the series. Here's the thing. When, when we're chasing God, what we find out is God is chasing us. He's running towards us with his arms wide open. And so we don't have to be defined by what we've done we can be defined by what Jesus did for us on the cross. We don't have to be defined by our failure, but we can be defined by his forgiveness. I'm gonna say it again because I know some of you need to hear this and you need to believe this. You are not defined by what you've done. You're defined by what God has done for you. 
Your identity right now is not in your failure, but your new identity can be in God's forgiveness. Here's the thing, at the end of the day, all we are, you know, we're the church, we're Christians, there's these names for us. All we are is a group of ragtag scrubs and screw-ups who have been forgiven by God's grace. That's the Bible and that's real life. This is not the perfect people club. This is the forgiven failure collective. Each one of us, listen, our stories, it's not about perfection. It's about God's grace in spite of our imperfection. We are poster kids for grace. You know, every, every company needs a model to show off what they can do. You know, first they were this and now they're this. God's just looking for poster kids for his grace. People he can point to and say, if I can do it for them, I can do it for you. David was just another poster kid for grace. God saying, I can take this one and I can make him this. The great apostle Paul in the New Testament, what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. You got to believe this is what he's saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, this is Paul, he says, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul said, man, I'm just a poster kid for grace. David, poster kid for God, you can be too. Listen, the story God wants to tell through your life, I'll make it easy for you. You're not the hero, he is. You're not the star, he is. You're, you're not the superhero, superstar who comes in to save the day, that's him. You're the damsel in distress. You're the wimp tied to the railroad tracks. Jesus is the savior. He's the star and the hero. He came to save us. Why? Because that's what we need. That's why he came. But he can only save people who know they need it. People who admit they need it. People who ask for the help that he provides. His only condition for grace is you have to ask. I need you to know that you need it and ask me for what only I can give. And so as I think about this, what keeps me from the grace that God has for me? The first thing, it's pride. You know, when I think I can do this on my own, that is fake news. That is the devil. That is a lie that has been fact-checked by God and everyone who knows you. You are not perfect and you are not capable. You are imperfect. You are unholy. You are not capable of living a righteous life in your own power, but you've sinned and you've failed, but you are still loved and you are still chosen and you are still worth Jesus dying for. But my pride, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. My pride says, I got this. Pride keeps me from God's grace. Shame is another thing I see for so many people. Oh, pastor, you don't know who I am. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad I really am and how bad it really was. And that's the enemy trying to keep you from a God who loves you. The truth is no sin you've committed is greater than the sacrifice of Jesus. His sacrifice is greater than your sin. So we gotta take the shame out and we gotta run to him. I think the third thing that keeps me from the grace of God is often fear. I'm afraid to approach a holy God in my unholy state. We wear the fig leaves, we cover up and we give excuses. But when we come to God, we don't get what we deserve, we get what's in his heart. Hebrews 4 verse 16, it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So where are you at with God right now? Are, are you ready to come to him and get the grace you need that he so badly wants to give you? Or are you just content to stay right where you are? I'll tell you this, the revival that we're all looking for, the restoration, the reset we all need, it starts with repentance. Repentance is the starting line for revival. And God is ready to revive. Are you ready to repent? That's the question. And I'm actually gonna let David close us today. He knows firsthand what it's like to epically fail and blow it, but he also knows what it's like to be forgiven by God. And so what he says in Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, 
Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. Now, here's, here's the contrast. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long before confession, before repentance. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Are you resisting or are you repenting? Are you running to the Father or are you running from? This whole series is called Chasing God and he's inviting us to chase him. And what we find when we catch him is that his grace is enough. Let's pray right now. Lord, thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for your amazing grace. I wanna thank you. David experienced it in a way that few of us personally ever will, hopefully, because uh, Lord, I pray that your grace keeps us from sinning as David did. Uh, we know that sin has consequence and cost and we see it in his life, but Lord, we also see the depths of your love and forgiveness demonstrated in David's life. And so all of us can relate to what it feels like to carry the weight, to carry the shame, to carry the guilt. I'm praying today, Lord, that we would come to you and believe that you and your grace are sufficient, that even still you love us, that no matter how many times we run you over with that golf cart, you still love us and we're still in the family. Uh, Lord, I, I, I know there's some people today that need to lift their eyes towards you. I thank you for David's testimony. He says, I know what it felt like to hold it in and not come clean. And I know the difference of being forgiven by God when you confess and repent. So thank you, Lord, that you've made a provision. And I just pray for some people today to take you at your word, to trust that your intentions for us are good and to truly believe the gospel that despite what we've done, we're not defined by what we've done, we're defined by what Jesus did for us on the cross. That our identity, God, is not in our failure, but our identity is in our forgiveness as your children. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to say a special thanks to our lead pastor, Justin Miller, for that fantastic message about David and Nathan, how to bounce back after failure. Now, we're not going to go anywhere just yet. We're going to hang around because we would love the opportunity to pray with you if you have a prayer request. If you have a prayer request, please do not leave this stream. Do not leave this broadcast without giving us the opportunity to pray with you. So our folks are going to be on, our moderators or prayer hosts are going to be on. They'd love to pray with you. If you have a prayer request, you can drop it in the chat. And alternatively, you can always reach us at prayer at real.life. So that's going to do it for us. We want to say thank you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We truly hope that you experience God. We are believing and praying God's best for you. And we'll see you next time.